Ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham, this is X-Plane 11, and the PT-19 by Uncle Jack Simulations. This is part one of a video series. This particular PT-19 is called Spirit of Little Norway. Little Norway was a training camp for Norwegian pilots just outside of Toronto in Canada during the Second World War. And they, along with um, thousands of other pilots, flew this aircraft as a primary flight trainer. I've seen some reviews of this aircraft where the sim reviewer talks about uh, having an aircraft that's just nice to fly along and observe the scenery. And that is true, it's a, it's a pleasant aircraft to fly. But for me, the biggest strength in this aircraft is its original purpose, using it as a primary flight trainer. It's a very simple aircraft. It doesn't have an electrical system. It doesn't have really much in the way of flight instruments. It's got no navigation equipment, no radios. So it's back to basics. And as simulator pilots, we're used to flying very complicated, detailed aircraft. And sometimes the basic flying skills can get slightly forgotten. And that's what we're going to look at in this series. In real life, this aircraft is now based in Norway. So we're at an airfield called Cheller just outside Lillestrøm, and we're going to look at setting the aircraft up, getting airborne, and we're also going to have a look at the fixed pitch propeller and tailwheel handling, because that's something that's maybe new to a lot of simulator pilots. Let's jump inside. So we can see straight away that it's a, a very simple aircraft. We've got uh, altitude, airspeed, compass, engine instruments, uh, engine temperature, fuel pressure, oil pressure, RPM, and the clock. And with no electrical system, the clock is clockwork. So we've got to set it. It's actually about uh, five minutes slow just now. I'll just wind that forward. And then we wind it up to make sure it runs for the duration of the flight. With any piston aircraft, before we do much with that, I want to make sure the engine is safe to walk around the aircraft. So we check the throttle, the mixture, the fuel's off, and the mags are off. We'll unlock the flight controls, return the lock to the down position, and I'll extend the flaps for the walk around. First thing to do is just check behind the pilot seat here, look at the hydraulic fluid reservoir. This is simply for the brakes, the uh, tow brakes on the aircraft, so make sure there's some hydraulic fluid, and then we'll have a look around the outside. If you want to shortcut this, you can use the preferences menu to get the aircraft ready to go. But I think in this particular aircraft, the walk around is really in keeping with the spirit of this aircraft, with, the, with what it was really designed to do. I'm going to use my internal view camera and just move it around. Um, at the moment, I don't think it supports uh, operating the external features from the external camera. So you do need to move the view around. First things first, we're going to put some fuel in the tanks. We've got 22 and a half gallons per side, so a total capacity of 45 gallons, and it burns just about 10 gallons an hour. So we've got uh, about four hours of playtime with the aircraft. On the back of the wing here, we've extended the flaps, so let's have a look at those. You can see the upper surface is undisturbed, but underneath we've got these big split flaps. They're called split flaps because the bottom surface folds and the, the upper surface doesn't. These flaps are great at producing drag. They're very draggy. Uh, they're not so good at producing lift. They're not so efficient at producing lift. A lot of drag with these flaps. There's nothing else really to look at from a sim perspective on this side of the aircraft. Apart from the tyre, the tyre will show visible damage when it's worn. So we need to just have a, a good look at that. And then we come up here to the engine. Actually, there's uh, some bug marks around here we should probably have wiped off. I'm pretty bad at keeping the aircraft clean. Some up on the windscreen as well. Let's get rid of that. So looking at the engine, the first thing about the engine, looking at it from the front, is it's a, what's called an inverted engine. The crankshaft that drives the propeller is at the top. If I take the covers off, you can see the cylinders at the bottom. Now this arrangement means that it's fairly common for oil, there's another bug mark there, it's fairly common for oil to drain down into the cylinders and if too much oil gets down there you can actually end up with 
what's called a hydraulic lock. So the cylinders won't be able, or the pistons won't be able to move in the cylinders. And that would be a bad thing. We don't want to start the engine until we've checked that. So what I'm going to do is put the crank handle in and we'll turn it over a few times. Five turns on the crank handle is what's required. And I can see the crank handle is moving with my mouse cursor here. So it's moving freely. I'm just going to turn it over until I get that propeller into a more of a horizontal position. I'll do. Take the crank handle out. Now we can also take the cowling off. We'll take these fasteners off. We don't need to do this for the walk around, um, but it's important to have a look at some of the other features the aircraft has. If I pop the cover off, in here we can see we've got the uh, carburetor. Let me just zoom in. So on the on the engine here, this is the this is the carburetor, and this here is the idle screw. So this is the throttle cable. If I move the throttle with my joystick, you can see that what happens is this screw sets the point where idle is. As I move the throttle lever to idle, this screw sets what idle speed is. And that's important on this aircraft. We'll look at that when we get the engine started. Also down here, we've got uh, oil drain. If we want to service the oil, the oil drains down there. That'll drain all the oil out the uh, engine. Let's put it all back together and we'll continue the walk around. Excellent. So round to the front. We've already checked the, the cylinders for oil pooling, but we've also got the oil cooler filter and the air intake filter. And they will both visibly show wear as well. They'll show uh, dirt accumulating on the front of them. These ones both look in good condition. Coming around to this side, there's more bug marks everywhere. Should really try a lot harder to keep this aircraft clean. On the side of the cowling, this is the oil cooler outlet here, and this is the oil, uh, the dipstick and the filler. So if I look on the dipstick, you see my oil, it's fairly low, and it's also not the cleanest of oil. It'll do for today, but we do want to fill it up. So if I just click on the oil can up here, you'll see it fills oil on the dipstick. We'll close it up. We can take this side off as well if we want to. There's four fasteners there. Pop the cover off and you can see this is the pipe work for the oil cooler. Oil cooler's in here and the uh, out, uh, output side of the oil cooler. Put those fasteners back on. Always check this one. I found that as I open and close the door it's very easy to lose that fastener. We'll put some more fuel in this side as well. Fill this tank up. It's the magic jerry can here. That's uh, 10 gallons. This tire is in good condition. And the thing that's very easy to forget is the remove before flight uh, thing here on the pito cover. Beyond that, there's not really much else to do with the aircraft. Whilst we're on the outside, we'll just uh, pop around the back. See how detailed it is, even uh, inside the rear fuselage, inside the inside the uh, vertical stabilizer, the tail fin, we've got all the mechanism simulated on there. There's also a, a little storage locker here just behind the cockpits. And if we want to put the aircraft away, we can click on this uh, cover here and that'll put all the covers in place. So close it up and secure it and we'll jump inside. And that's us basically ready to start the engine. But before we do that, one of the things we're going to look at in this video is the propeller. This aircraft has got a fixed pitch propeller. By fixed pitch, what I mean is the angle of the blades is locked. It doesn't change. The baron over here, the blades can twist. So this, uh, the baron has got effectively an, an automatic gearbox and this aircraft is stuck in one gear. If you compare it to a car, the baron's automatic and the PT-19 is stuck in one gear. It's probably stuck in second gear, to be honest. It's important to look at the angle of these blades as well. When the aircraft's on the ground, let me just change my view momentarily. So the nose is up and the tail is down. 
and that means the propeller is not directly facing the oncoming air. Now this blade, the, side, the blade closest to me, is going up and the blade going down is on the other side. If we look at the two angles, we can see that this blade is basically directly vertical and this blade is at about 30 degrees. So with the tail on the ground, the descending blade is going to produce more thrust than the blade that's going up. Now it doesn't look like it when we're in this view. Obviously we're aligned with the fuselage and the blades are obviously at the same but opposite angles. But when we align the view with the ground, you can see that it's different. So one of the things about a propeller is although you think the thrust line is directly centered on the fuselage, it actually changes based on where the relative airflow is. With the tail on the ground and the nose up, the thrust line is effectively out to the right because the propeller turns clockwise as seen here. And that means the aircraft is going to pull to the left because the thrust line is offset to the right. That's called P factor and it's an important consideration. It affects all propellers, but with a tailwheel aircraft, because it starts off out of the line of airflow, it's more pronounced. Pilots on this aircraft were taught to fly bigger, faster aircraft. This is a training device. The propeller on this aircraft is fairly light. It's a, a wooden propeller. If you're flying a P-51 Mustang with 1500 horsepower, the propeller is massive. The propeller suffers from gyroscopic effects, just as it does if it's the rotor on a helicopter. So when we bring the tail of the aircraft up, we're sitting tail down at the moment. As we run down the runway and lift the tail up, we're essentially pushing the top of the propeller disc forward. But that translates with a clockwise turning propeller, pushing the top of the propeller disc forward, effectively also creates a yaw reaction. And again, it goes to the left because the input and the output of a gyro are about 90 degrees apart. So as we lift the tail, we will also get a left yaw tendency. That's two items that have caused left yaw straight away. There's another consideration. And from behind the aircraft, the vertical tail, if I, you know, looking along the fuselage, if I zoom in just a little bit, the propeller doesn't just accelerate air along the fuselage. It does start to rotate the air as well. The air will circulate. And as it comes down the fuselage, it will eventually encounter the vertical tail. So imagine a cylinder of air circulating. And as it impacts the tail, it will be from the left hand side and it will push that tail to the right. Now that's another left yaw factor. So we've got P factor, we've got the gyro and the slipstream effects. We've got three separate things that are pushing the aircraft to the left, pushing the nose of the aircraft to the left. And they all vary with the power. There's one other item to be aware of, and that's engine torque. And again, this is a fairly lightweight propeller, but for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And as the aircraft tries to turn the propeller to the right, the consequence is the propeller tries to turn the aircraft to the left. Now on this aircraft, that's barely perceptible, but it will effectively push the left-hand wheel firmer onto the tarmac or into the grass if you're in a grass field. That causes more drag on the left-hand side, which can cause a left yaw. And if you were airborne, if I just lift the flaps at the moment, if you were airborne, and you apply a lot of power in an aircraft uh, with a, obviously a much more powerful engine, you would get a left roll. And if I try and correct that left roll by putting in some right stick, if we remember basic aerodynamics, I'm trying to produce more lift on this side and less lift on this side. That's more drag and less drag. So more drag on the left hand side, less drag on the right hand side. No surprises, that's another left yaw tendency. So knowing which way the engine rotates is kind of important. And the majority of engines are clockwise rotation. If you've got a British aircraft, it may have anti-clockwise rotation. So it's just something to be aware of. But this aircraft, all of the effects that you'll feel on takeoff will pull the aircraft to the left. We had P factor, that's to do with the angle of the blades to the relative airflow. We had the gyroscopic effect, 
That's to do with the fact that as we move the top of the propeller disc forward, lifting the tail, we're actually producing a yaw input. We've got the slipstream effect caused by the airflow proceeding down the side of the fuselage, circulating and pushing the tail from the side. And uh, lastly, we've got the torque simply caused by the mechanical uh, effects of the engine. Whilst we're talking about the propeller, one last thing before we start the engine up. Imagine the propeller turning in stationary air. It's basically got air, it's sucking some air forward if you like, it's pushing some air back, but it's not really moving, it's, it's in a static lump of air. So the angle of attack, the angle the air meets the blade on the propeller is more or less fixed. As we go faster and faster, you're going to get a forward aspect, a forward element to the air. So rather than the air coming from, imagine this upgoing blade, rather than the air coming from the top down, it's coming at an angle. And if you look at it, that is reducing the effective angle of attack on those propeller blades. The propeller is just another aerofoil. Angle of attack is lift, and lift is drag. So with an aircraft like this, that as you accelerate, the load on the propeller gets less. As you go faster, the load on the propeller gets less, the drag on the propeller gets less, and the engine speed will increase. So the only instrument we've got to measure power output is the RPM, but the RPM will change without me changing the throttle position if I simply change the airspeed. It's an important thing, and we can have a look at that when we get airborne. Right, that's about enough chatting. Let's get the engine started, and we'll uh, launch off on this mission. We've got the flaps up, we've got the controls free, and thankfully it's fairly straightforward to get started. There's no electrical system, as I said, but we do need fuel pressure to start. So we've got a pump down here. I'm going to set the fuel on. At the moment, both tanks have got the same amount, so I'm going to start on the right tank. We would really select the lowest tank to start on, and I'll set the mixture full forward. So this is my fuel pressure gauge here, and all I do is work the wobble pump. And I'm looking for around about five pounds on the fuel pressure, basically the top of the green arc. Having done that, we'll jump outside. I'll put the open the primer lock here. This is the primer. I'll give it three pumps. I'll lock the primer, I'll put the crank handle in, and then we'll set the mags to left. We'll talk about that in a second as we start up, but we'll always start on the left mag. I've got throttle Mixture, fuel, mags. Jump outside, make sure we're clear of the propeller, and we'll crank. It fires straight away. I'll take the crank handle out. Take the chocks out, and we'll jump inside. Now that it's running, we'll go on to both mags. So at the moment, we've got fairly... Uh, poor oil pressure, it's not very stable at all, so we need to let it warm up. With the engine being so cool, uh, so cold, the uh, rough indication on the oil pressure is uh, really a sign that the engine's not ready to go. So while that needle's bouncing around, we'll keep the RPM below 1000. The reason we started on the left mag is because the left mag has got what's called an impulse coupling. The impulse coupling slows the spark down and makes it more intense. So the spark happens uh, at a later point in the engine rotation cycle than it would when it's normally running. That's the only way to start an engine when it's turning at a very slow RPM. And all piston engine aircraft have this. They will all start on the mag with an impulse coupling. The left mag's got an impulse coupling, the right mag doesn't. If you're starting on a key, when you put the key to the start position, it will only work with the mag with the impulse coupling. It's all automatic in the key itself. Over this aircraft, start on the left mag. So it's still warming up. We'll just have a look outside. And it's tailwheel aircraft. So we can actually, we can maneuver the aircraft with some of the airflow here. I'm just gonna hold some aft stick and watch my tailwheel move with the rudder. The tailwheel is at the moment completely locked to that rudder movement. But if I go to full rudder deflection, 
you see the tailwheel brakes out, it's now free casting. Okay, I can lock it back in again by applying some elevator pressure and now it's locked. Taxi with slight uh, back pressure on the stick and make gentle movements on the rudder. If you want to do pivot turns, you can break the tailwheel out by applying full rudder. Very straight order. So our pressure's warmed up nicely. We'll take the brake off and we'll start moving forward. Now on a tailwheel aircraft, you would tend to look out one side, look out the other side, and basically taxi in a, a weaving pattern. So turn to the right, look to the left, turn to the left, look to the right. In the simulator, I find it's far easier just to work with a view that's set back a little bit. This makes it more usable. You see the temperature's rising already, it's about 40 degrees. So I'm just going to hold a little bit of aft stick to make sure that wheel stays locked and we'll taxi in. So I really want to make sure that we uh, don't uh, cause any damage to these parked aircraft, the, the piggy on the right hand side, the left hand side there, or the two Cessnas. So we'll make sure we find somewhere out of the way to do the power checks. As I said, we've got to work fairly quickly with this aircraft, otherwise we will overheat. Just beside this Cessna here looks ideal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a full rudder input and that breaks the tailwheel out and then I'm going to use some differential braking just holding the right hand uh, brake a little bit of power, a little bit of rudder and we can pivot around. Having done that, I'll hold the brakes hit the parking brake and we'll do our run up. Now if you follow the checklist to the letter you would do the run up and then you would change the fuel tanks. I prefer to do the run up on the same fuel tank that I'm going to use to get airborne. I want to make sure that that fuel tank can sustain the engine at full power. So I will always change tanks first of all. Now we're on the left tank. I'm going to hold some aft stick and I'm going to bring the RPM up to 2000 RPM. At 2000 I'm going to go from both mags to the left mag. I notice a slight drop. I go back to both mags. Leave it for a few seconds. And then go to the right mag. Again, I see a slight drop. And it's about the same drop as I saw on the left mag. Back to both. I'm going to check the carb heat. This feeds hot air into the intake and melts any ice that may have developed in the carb system. And back to cold. I'm going to bring the power all the way back to idle. And this is where I've got my idle RPM set. I've set it to about 500 RPM, which is the bottom of the green arc. You can do it from the, from the menu system there as well. But I want my RPM really as low as I can get, otherwise you'll have trouble with flatless approaches. We normally do flatless approaches in this aircraft. But the power check is complete, we just have to run through some quick pre-takeoff checks. Hatches and harnesses, well it's all secured. Instruments, flight instruments are set, checked. Engine indications are fine, it's a touch on the hot side, but we'll get there. Throttle friction is not a thing in the simulator. Trim, we'll set nose up trim, about the N on nose up. Mixture is full rich, mags are on both, prop is fixed pitch. The primer uh, on the front was locked. Fuel is selected to the left tank. We've got full tanks on both sides, sufficient for the mission. Flaps are up for the takeoff. Carp heat's cold and flight controls. We'll just do a quick check around the box here. Before takeoff check's complete. 70 degrees Celsius, we're good to go. I'll take the brake off. I'll break that rudder out again and I'll apply some fill brake and some rudder and we'll pivot turn here. See, it can really turn quite tightly, but you wouldn't really want to do this unnecessarily because you're kind of scrubbing that left hand tire a little bit. Having finished the pivot turn, a little bit of aft stick locks that tailwheel in again. Have a good look round, make sure there's nobody else in the pattern, and we're good to line up. So takeoffs and landings with this aircraft are done without flap. 
The nose should be up by about 60 miles an hour. We'll fly the aircraft off at 70 and initial climb between 80 and 90. I prefer 90 because it's better for engine cooling. As we line up, just check the oil pressure and the fuel pressure. So remember, we're learning to fly a much more powerful piston-engined aircraft, so I want to be smooth with the power application. As we line up, this is one last chance to check the runway is clear, because as we line up, we're blind ahead. It's all good. I'll bring the power smoothly up, and I'll counteract the torque with my rudder input. Just using my peripheral vision and a point in the distance. There's 60, tails up, 17, positive rotation, and I'll just put the nose roughly on the horizon and we'll fly away. And I'm just going to accelerate to 90 knots. See my RPM at 90 miles an hour, I should say. My RPM's already at the red line, so I'm going to make a power reduction. I'm back to about 2300. I fly with a twist grip joystick, so I always find it useful, even if the aircraft is not fitted with a rudder trim, to make sure that I've got the rudder trim available, simply to keep that ball in the middle. It's a lot easier in a real aircraft where slip is done by feel, but in the simulator I find having the trim, the rudder trim, is really useful. So at 90 miles an hour, we've already had to make a power reduction to keep the RPM within limits. As I said, it's like driving a car that's stuck in gear. If your car can't change out of first to second gear, uh, you're going to have to back off the power before you go too quickly. And it's exactly the same. That's why constant speed props are fitted to all high performance piston engine aircraft, or all high performance propeller aircraft, I should say. Now at Lillestrum, we have to climb ahead to 1500 feet before we make the turn, and there's airspace at 2500 feet. We'll depart off the downwind leg, and we'll climb up to 2200. So I'm approaching 1500 feet, going to eyeball where we're going to turn, this is Oslo down here, on the left hand side, and the main road between Oslo City and uh, Oslo Airport, which is out there on the right. Here's 1500 feet, and we'll roll into the turn and coordinate with some rudder. And again, we're looking at the picture, looking at the attitude of the aircraft. There's no flight instruments we can really look at to fly this aircraft. The flight instruments are for reference, so we must fly by looking out the window. And it's a very easy aircraft to fly in that sense. Looking down to the left, that's the, uh, the village or the town of Lillestrøm there. And we'll turn and fly the downwind leg. As I said, climbing up to 2,200 feet to leave the pattern. And for gentle turns, I find the horizon on the nose is, is fine. Gentle climbing turns, put the horizon on the nose, and you should be fine. Speed's increased a little bit, and my temperature's coming down. It's only about 80 Celsius now. That's fine. That looks good for a downwind heading, downwind track. And it's important to have some power figures in mind. Here's 2200 feet, I'm going to lower the nose, I'm going to put the horizon roughly on my canopy bar there, and I'm going to bring the power back to about 2200, 2300, I'm going to trim in pitch and trim in yaw. So with my eye point, having the horizon running through the canopy line there tends to work. I'm at 105 miles an hour, that's roughly 90 knots, and my RPM is set to about 2,200 to 2,300. It really is as straightforward as that. But remember I was talking about the propeller and the fact that as you go faster, the engine has to work less hard if you like to turn the, turn the propeller. It means that the power settings we've got in mind are only valid for a given airspeed. So I know 105 miles an hour, 2200 RPM works. If I reduce my power, I'm going to come back to just below 2000, and I'll hold the pitch attitude to let the aircraft slow down. I'll hold the uh, altitude, I should say. So back at 95, 
I'm going to come back to 90 knots. 90 miles an hour, sorry. And I'll move the view around so you can see my throttle lever down on the left hand side. So I'm now going to open the throttle up to 2200 RPM, as close as I can get. Here's 2200. I'm not going to touch my throttle now. I'm just going to maintain level flight and let the aircraft accelerate. You see, as we get faster, the RPM increases. And that's fundamentally a fixed pitch propeller's behaviour. The power settings that we learn are only valid at an airspeed. You can't arbitrarily set RPM. On a constant speed propeller, let me just bring the power back now. On a constant speed propeller, you can set the propeller RPM, you can set the manifold pressure, and you'll have the same sort of output all the time. In this aircraft, we have to be careful of that propeller RPM. So we'll track down here towards the practice area, and in the next video, we're going to look at turning with the compass. Because you can see that we don't have any gyro on the aircraft, just the compass for navigation. And compass turns can be quite tricky. We're also going to take a look at trimming the aircraft for climbs and descents. Anything that we do in the PT-19 can be done in an aircraft like a 172 or a PA-28. Uh, those aircraft are obviously better equipped, they've got better instruments, more instruments, they've got electric systems for radios and navigation aids and engine starting. But everything that we learn with this aircraft will translate across to pretty much any piston aircraft. And the basic flying skills, the attitude flying it's called, where we just point the nose and we, we learn the picture, that translates to pretty much any type of aircraft. If you do have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. I do try my best to reply to all comments that are in there. Uh, sometimes it takes a few weeks. There's a bug strike as we're flying along, one of the features of this aircraft. But uh, as I said, I'll always try my best to respond to your comments. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you'll tune in again soon.